going. Yeah. Uh, and I've never seen it looking so bare. And that's a that's a you know it's an ancient limestone quarry that's seen lots of weather patterns in the past. Yeah. Um, so wow. yeah, I mean, yeah, good old Glastonbury though. That's brought on the rain back, hasn't it? Yeah, of course it has. Glastonbury <laughs> weekend. <laughs> <laughs> it has. Yeah, absolutely yeah just the mention of it <laughs> uh okay um well we're 7 33 now and we've got people joining us uh still through youtube but i think we'll uh, we'll get going uh welcome to everybody uh who's joined us this evening it's nice to see you um if i can't quite see you but you know what i mean it's nice to have you on board um i'm just going to press record if that's all right paul so that we can record your lovely voice um and um yeah so we're broadcasting on zoom and we're broadcasting on youtube as well so welcome to everybody who's joining us on zoom and everybody who's joining us on youtube as well it's great to see you again this is the third of our virtual meetings and i'm absolutely delighted to welcome paul wilkinson back um and you know paul's a, a great friend of the society from the canal and, and river trust and we're in for a a treat again this evening um just before we kick off it'll be the usual format so what i'm going to do is to um introduce paul uh, in in a moment and then paul will talk to us for sort of 35 40 minutes or so and then there'll be questions after after that now those of you who join us on zoom feel free to ask a question via audio and um, trust me it's not scary as it sounds we just unmute you which i know sounds slightly painful but it's not we'll unmute you uh, and then you can ask a question uh, of Paul. If you're on YouTube, um, you can put a question in the little chat box and I'll monitor that and I can uh, read that out to Paul uh, as well. So we'll do questions um, once Paul has, has finished. Um, we had um, a, a society council meeting uh, last week and we've um, got a plan in place that we'll continue to have these virtual talks now uh, through the summer and possibly into the early autumn. Of course, we still don't know when we're uh, going to be meeting face to face. So we're lining up uh, other speakers and we're really grateful for these speakers who are coming on board at short notice. And Paul is one of those. Um, so we've got other speakers uh, lined up for us through July and August um, and also for September as well. And, and then really it's a case of, I think, just playing it by ear as to when we can get back into uh, into the usual routine of meeting each other. Although, I suspect uh, from uh, the news that I'm hearing that may be a fair while off yet. So virtual is the way that we're going to have to do it. Uh, and I think we're all getting used to uh, to that idea now, aren't we? So um, it's great for you to join us. And without further ado, I'm going to introduce uh, Paul Wilkinson, um, who Paul is from the Canal and uh, River Trust. And you'll know that Paul has spoken to us uh, in the in the past. I think you've done probably two two talks now or three talks, Paul, to us, yeah? At least, yeah. And every one of them always goes down really well. And I'm really grateful to Paul for uh, stepping in at short notice to give us his talk, uh, A Natural History of the Midland Canals. So, Paul, it's over to you. Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Paul Wilkinson. I'm the senior ecologist and I've been working on the canals for 17 years now, so obviously seen quite a bit of the Midlands canals. And um, I'd just like to share a little bit of the wonderful diversity. I'm going to skip over subjects quite quickly um, because I've got at least 80 slides and 45 minutes. And so I've got to cram a few things in. So if you see anything, please ask questions at the end because I will be rushing through. And one of the terrible things We've just been through the last few months, but one of the things that has happened for the Canal River Trust um, has been that you have found where the, your local canals are and our footfall on the canals has gone through the roof. I think it's doubled or trebled in many areas, obviously because we connect so many um, communities, it's the nearest bit of um, natural space for them to exercise and um, get their bit of fresh air. So that's been one of the, one of the things that has come out of this. I do have to have a caveat that you are likely to hear my dogs through this and um, they bark at everything. So um, please uh, forgive me for that. Right. Obviously, wonderful history to the canals. Um, Start the Industrial Revolution and uh, connected the coal fields to the villages and the cities and very industrial places. 
um, first canals in the area, you know, 1769. And they were really um, contaminated, busy places. And places like the Canuck Extension Canal, which we see as a rural canal now, um, it's noted that there was a four foot um, tidal wave every day at noon with the amount of traffic that was going up and down it. There'd have also been um, very little health and safety back in those days. And uh, there would have been all sorts of materials, particularly coal, but all sorts of bulky materials transported and there'd have been accidents and spillages, and we have that legacy in the silt uh, even today. Obviously, if anyone has ever dug, in a, dug a pond, um, certainly nothing but credit to the um, creation of the canals. Um, there were 3,000 miles originally, and now we're down to a third of that. Uh, 2,000 miles left, we lost a third, sorry. And incredible, you know, muscle power and pony power. Um, and wheelbarrow power, incredible feats, and the um, engineering that went in was incredible. Something that has to be treasured to this day. This is a map of roughly the area of I cover, um, of the Midlands and the network of canals, and the orange bits are the old bits that are under restorations um, or lost, and have groups actively working on them as we speak. As you can see, the central area of Birmingham and the Black Country has a real dense network of canals, and there's a real diversity in there, which is one of the best areas in the middle and in the in the country for uh, diversity of canals due to that dense network. Not too far away from where we are at the moment, this is the uh, Bentley Canal, um, or was, and this is Bentley Bridge up in the top right-hand corner. So this is a picture from the 80s. And it shows a wonderful green corridor. Um, and just imagine the wildlife that would have been down there. Um, and obviously not a lot of wildlife on Bentley Bridge. Um, and as you can see, the Dens Arm and the car park and then the retail. So that's just showing you um, the change in land use and the, potentially the loss loss of, a, of um, an opportunity. Um, loss, obviously, the canal will never be restored again. But just a loss of green space and linear network, especially uh, nowadays when we're so, you know, we so value so much walking open spaces and, and green corridors and networks. So something to be learned going forward about, you know, protecting these corridors, maybe. This is just down the road from where we are. Well, it's most of us, I imagine. Um, Swindon, Swindon Lock, where the school would be and houses. Uh, this is from Waterways World, just showing you how quickly the industrial revolution and do industrial landscape changes and can be lost um, and, and becomes a different purpose. So this industrial landscape has now turned into a very wonderful green space um, and its role has changed. There's still a little bit of industry. There's still uh, there are people living on the canal, um, but obviously, it's a lot more about the, the towpath is becoming very valuable nowadays, not just for horses, for, for people now. And all that history has left a lot of heritage. Um, a lot of all the canals um, had different landowners, had to cross different land ownership, and um, the heritage often reflects that. This is just down the road from where we are, Allbridge, and this is an ancient scheduled monument. And we have lots and lots of heritage on the canal network. And some of that heritage um, was constructed using lime mortar uh, to, and because lime mortar expands and works with the, the handmade bricks rather than concrete, which can split them. And one of the consequences of that is that lime loving plants now colonize the bridges. And in some cases, in some counties, there are very rare plants that only occur on canal bridges. Um, such as rusty back fern and spleenworts, and in the Black Country, Plowman's Spickenard um, occurs on a few bridges in Dudley. And this little one is Walroo. As you can see, totally artificial, lock gates um, helping water go uphill and downhill. And um, in the Midlands, we have well over a thousand lock gates, um, which need replacing roughly every 20 years. Uh, usually in the winter and obviously holds a lot of water back so it is all controlled and artificial and there's a lot of water lost over the particularly the summer when the um, 
recreational boating and a lot of boat, boat movement occurs. And we've got lots of trees. I wish that I've got the figure for you. I know how many we, we, we have to fell due to safety. Um, but I, I wished I knew what our number of uh, tree assets was. It will be in the hundreds of thousands, if not millions. And the link there is that um, we now have some wonderful oak woodlands along the canal network. Um, and the oaks are obviously the, what went into the lock beams and still do at the Bradley workshop. We still use um, UK oak lock beams. And also um, elm was part of the paddles of the lock gate, which used to be used, but obviously um, really struggle to find elm nowadays with Dutch elm disease. And you need large, big, mature trees, which would have been very common back in the heydays of the canals, but obviously now um, very rare to see a mature elm tree. Actually, but the, the link is that um, oaks are one of the best, well, they're probably the best tree for wildlife. They have so much biodiversity associated with them and uh, the number of insects and invertebrates that feed on the leaves um, is in the hundreds, 400s uh, different species, if, if not more. And that obviously creates a whole network of biodiversity in itself. And elm, um, species like the white lettered hair streak um, breed caterpillars feed on the elm leaves. In the Midlands, we have 27 tunnels. Um, and they sometimes keep me busy because obviously they're, they're um, old heritage and uh, very important places. And sometimes uh, we have bat interest. This one is at Shrewley and the, the top tunnel is where the horse would have gone over the, um, the so this actually goes through the village of Shrewsley to avoid um, obviously the village of Shrewsbury. And the horse would have gone up over the hill while the boat was legged through the tunnel. Um, one of the main interests of bats in these tunnels is Natra's bats and Dorbenton's bats. And they, there's a, a gap in the line in between the old brickwork and the new brickwork, which they love. We have 30 reservoirs um, and all these, all the, all the canals and all the lock gates, every time they're open, need to replenish with water. So obviously in the winter, it's winter storage. And then in the summer, we let the water out to refill it to keep the canals um, level. And we have a wonderful diversity of reservoirs around the area that have themselves have become very important for wildlife. Many of them very important for overwintering birds um, and waterfowl. A lot of kilometres of canals, towpaths, um, as hopefully many of you uh, know. And all very diverse. This is the centre of Birmingham and we have some very rural, wonderful canals. And... Really, the, the wildlife isn't restricted to the, the rural areas. In some of the urban areas, we have some wonderful old heritage plants that have hung on several hundred years. Um, and in some cases, there is more diversity in some urban areas and post-industrial areas than actually in the rural areas. Um, and there was a study done on pollinators and actually some of the more brownfield industrial sites have more pollinators than many of the rural ones. And the canals provide that link between the rural and the, and the city and often provides a corridor through the cities. And one of our charity objectives is um, to promote and to, pr to protect and to, encourage and to enhance biodiversity and that natural history. One of the designated ways that shows the importance of our um, some of our sites is to be designated as the top triple SI sites of special scientific interest. And we also have special areas of conservation in the area. And as you can see, they're pretty evenly spread over the patch. And this is the um, Canuck Extension Canal, not too far away, um, designated and protected because of its water plants. So in the past, many of these plants would have been very common in the landscape. Um, and now because the canals held on through that period of time and lots of ponds and waterways have been drained or lost, they're now the only example of where these plants occur. And there we have Fens Pools, um, which used to be the Pens Net Chase and totally enclosed by um, housing and industry and very, very important for nature conservation. The features there are for amphibians um, and great crested newts. Sorry. 
Ben's Pools feeds the Stairbridge Canal, which feeds into our Staff Staffordshire and Worcestershire Canal. Um, Towpaths are wonderful because in many cases they haven't been improved by any fertilizers. They haven't changed in several hundred years, so they contain wonderful plants. Um, this one here is the flowering rush, which again is quite common through the Black Country canals, the, um, the quieter canals maybe, um, and the little lock, um, lock pounds where there's um, sheltered areas. This is um, a plant very worthy of Kew Gardens or a Chelsea Flower Show. And this picture is actually taken in Great Bridge. And the Canuck Extension is designated primarily for its floating water plantain, which is this little um, inconspicuous plant um, which grows in its millions on the Canuck Extension Canal. Uh, very small flower, you need a lot of them to take a, a bunch home uh, to your mother. And on the Canuck Extension, we also have, um, so one of the connections that we're trying to make is that these are wonderful, special places, but actually all nature has its wonderful, special qualities. And this little plant here is called Eyebright, and in the past it was used to treat eye, eye ailments, and it's still being used in medical research. It's got wonderful quali quantities, uh, qualities, um, particularly associated with eye ailments. Fence Pools Amphibians, a wonderful resource for children and adults alike. One of the things about being connected to urban areas is that we often have urban issues as well, such as introductions of exotic species, plants and animals. This is the Alpine Newt, which is um, an exotic from Europe um, associated with a disease that affects amphibians and also we don't know how it competes with native amphibians at the moment, so they're being monitored. Not uh, obviously illegal to introduce non-native species um, and very bad idea. We also have people that have introduced um, the American signal crayfish and the Turkish narrow claw crayfish in the um, objective of coming back at a later date so they can harvest them as a food source. And obviously that is very, um, it's illegal. It's introduced the crayfish plague, which is affecting our native crayfish and they're also affecting biodiversity in a big big way. And the signal crayfish can actually deplete biodiversity to almost um, a stage where they're having to cannibalize themselves because they've, they've eliminated every, all the other invertebrates. This is the Anglesey Branch Canal, one of my favorites, um, up near Chasewater. And the reason why this is wonderful is that we've got slightly alkaline water with alkaline species, but this is very much dry acidic heathland and we've got the dry heath and the, and the wet heath. And it's an, a good example of where lowland heathlands meet the north, northern heathlands and right mixture of species, including tubular water dropwort. And this little gem here. Um, so the Canal River Trust are, have a well-being focus um, and linking nature is very much about well-being and also um, what we eat and some of the benefits and the antioxidants that we get from food. And this little berry here that you can see is, um, this is wild cranberry and it's a very rare plant and we have to protect this. I can't tell you exactly where it is because um, we, it is not enough for everybody's Christmas dinner by any means. But what we should be working for for conservation is to make sure that there is lots and lots of these plants so as people can know where they are um, and we can put lots of, you know, you might not be able to collect cranberries, but you might be able to um, collect some fruit from somewhere else because obviously there's lots of health benefits from doing that. This is the little sundew. This one's the Anglesey branch. Um, this one's designated for its pondweeds and also its water voles. Um, and as you can see, this is actually the towpath behind those meadow sweet flowers. Uh, meadow sweets, obviously medicinal and edible flowers as well. Um, and one of the reasons the water, vol water voles has held on is because of the lush habitat on both sides of the canal. Yeah, so pondweeds, not very um, studied widely, not on everybody's list um, of natural history books, but um, these are the Potomagetans that are the proper um, native pondweeds that we have and obviously quite rare nowadays. Um, and sometimes quite difficult to identify. 
Talking of the white claw crayfish, there used to be um, huge populations on the canals. Um, even 17 years ago, there were jobs where um, we used to do um, fish rescues and crayfish rescues and just move them when we were doing the lock stoppages and they would take several hundred crayfish from a very short pound of canal. And they have pretty much all been lost on the canal network. Um, a few years back with the University of Derbyshire and um, Sea Life Centre, we had a funded project which did environmental DNA of the canal network. So we were collecting samples of water and uh, Chris there was sampling it for environmental DNA of crayfish. And um, so it, actually all the DNA of every living creature that swum through that section of canal could, have, could be tested um, for its DNA. And one of the wonderful things about environmental DNA is that it's 100% um, proof, a confirmed record. Um, and it came back quite, quite badly for us because all the white claw, white claw crayfish locations, apart from a few isolated reservoirs, have now disappeared and they've been replaced by the signal crayfish, which has not only spread its disease, but it also outcompetes because it's a bigger, stronger crayfish. This is a, I've got lots of terrible um, video footage on my phone, which I like to share, as some of you might know. That is just showing a little white claw crayfish at a site not too far away from where we are. And these are now very, very important sites um, of our last few populations. And some of the canals are also designated of importance for its geology. So when the canal was cut through, um, this used to be a tunnel and it collapsed. And this is a truly um, and it's exposed some wonderful geology that you wouldn't normally be able to interpret because it would be under the ground. Um, and these are very wonderful sites. And obviously with the geology, there's some wonderful flora as well. And not just the designated things, but we've still got some very important um, natural heritage going on um, right, in the, right in Sandwell and Birmingham and on the offside of the canal we've got some last remnants of the Birmingham Heath um, and bilberries and cowberries and we're trying desperately to um, protect the last remaining bits and to actually encourage them on large landscape projects so we're working with the local community and we've been collecting seed and spreading it in various areas and we've already had success um, so I want to turn Galton Valley absolutely pink in the end of the summer with, uh, with Heather in a few years' time. So again, with the natural heritage, our water voles from archaeological evidence have been with us um, since the last ice age, so when we were separated from Europe. Um, they again were very common on the canal network to the point that in the early days of the canal network, they actually employed um, water vole. Uh, pest controllers to stop them with a the worry of them um, damaging the canal banks. Um, obviously now very, very rare and protected and lots of conservation effort going in for them. Um, one of the things that we've been working with is the um, Wildside Activity Centre and the Wildlife Trust where we've been funding coil roll projects. And this is um, just in section of Wolverhampton going up towards the I-54 and George Reese has been sending us in pictures of evidence that the work that it's been working. These are the water voles up in Wolverhampton. And what we've been that coir roll there that was being unloaded, you can see on the offside of the canal. And um, sorry about that. This is to um, this is the old trench sheet, the engineers trench sheet piling. Um, very good for engineers, but not great for wildlife. So we've been putting the coir rolls in front of the piling and that habitat was just a few months later after instalment. And it goes from strength to strength to the point that you wouldn't even know it was an artificial bank if you walked along that section now. And lots of research has proven that coir rolls are really good for water voles. Some of the other well-being benefits for us are um, being next to water. Um, are actually, it's a very clean um, environment to walk in. So this is Smedic High Street and this is Galton Valley, just the other side. Uh, the two canals, the old main line and the new main line. And one of the benefits is actually, these are quite heavily polluted environments nowadays, as we're all aware. 
and cycling and walking and um, trying to do our bit um, you you know can be quite harmful to our health um, in certain environments and certain occasions so actually walking the canal towpath this vegetation is actually blocking a lot of that pollutants and so actually we believe that these sections of canal are actually quite nice clean air environments to exercise and to commute in and to cycle and to live and to boat. And that 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 serve, that um, research there up to 60% reduction from um, vegetation that was simply silver birch trees in pots placed out of outside houses in front of a very busy road. And so we believe that a dense a de dense section of um, habitat and trees would probably be up to 90% or more. And also a lot of the health benefits are often hidden. So we, we you know, we might, be, some people might be happy to see wallflowers, but actually this little plant here, Scutellaria skullcap, I found some evidence that actually this family of plants is being um, tested in its research against COVID um, because it has inflammatory qualities and it's medicinal qualities that might be held. So it, these plants might not cure things, but they certainly all build up to, um, to health benefits. And <clears throat> they'll often have hidden health benefits, which is why we need to protect them before we lose these plants, before we even understand what they can, might be able to cure or help us with. Uh, Topaths, um, this is on the Town Valley Canal, um, just, just up from our Great Bar. And obviously we've got the bee orchids in there. And I know that the bee orchids and the um, certain types of plants have been there since the 80s recorded in the 80s and getting the towpath cutting is very important to us and something that um, is very difficult to get right obviously these towpaths have to be cut we can't just let them um, scrub up and obviously the diversity would be lost if we didn't cut them um, and we've got so many kilometers of canals it's understanding where the important bits are and applying the right sort of towpath cutting to them uh, very, very good for pollinators. And this was taken um, a couple of weeks ago. This is just down the road from us in Kidderminster. And again, um, the humble oxide daisy is, we talk about orchids and we get excited about rare plants, but this common plant is one of the best uh, for pollinators and wildlife. And a small patch is absolutely amazing at bringing wildlife in. Um, and it's um, obviously, it does it by itself. If you just leave a verge uncut, um, but it does like to seed into the mown areas, so you can't just walk away from mowing. These flowers like to seed into short areas and then the following year they'll flower. And some of our industrial sites um, are very interesting as well, where we've had housing maybe 100 years ago, 200 years ago. Um, and, uh, you know, for some health and safety reason, a building might need to be pulled down and it's piled in a corner and some wonderful things happen from native plants and plants that might have been in the gardens a couple of hundred years ago or a hundred years ago. For instance, here we've got Italian um, toad flax and we've got Erin's rod or mullein and we've got snapdragons and valerian and all sorts of things going on amongst uh, native plants like poppies and um, corn marigolds and ragworts and there is um, wild rocket as well here, which is obviously edible um, and a very nice plant. And maybe a little glimpse of when this, this centre of Birmingham was a little, little bit more rural and would have had agriculture right on its doorstep. We also have opium poppies, which are obviously from very modern somebody's garden. So taking all that wonderful um, triple SIs and the industrial brownfields and people's gardens and rewilding, and we've brought that right into the heart of the middle of Birmingham because obviously this was known as a little bit of a barrier for, for a lot of wildlife. Um, wonderful place to work and shop and live, but obviously very harsh for wildlife to move through. So we set up a project to um, bring habitats into the city centre. And that was purposefully for the benefit of people, because if we work on um, making things right for people, then the pollinators and the wildlife will actually benefit as well. So that it was very much focused on uh, fruit trees and old cottage gardens and mixing in native plants as well, but making it look good. So as all the people that wouldn't go to a nature reserve um, might actually um, stop and look and learn and might ask questions and then might be more interested 
in nature conservation. And we're using moths as well um, as indicators because they are um, wonderful bio indicators. And so far from setting moth traps up in the city center, um, it's showing how sort of deprived the habitats are in the city center. So we, we actually found um, three species of moth and about eight individual moths in several sessions of moth trapping. Now, if anybody that's done moth trapping and you set it up in your garden, you'll know that that's very, very poor. You normally get hundreds of moths in a moth trap overnight. And moths feed on vegetation, all different types of um, plants. And the less plants you have, the less moths you have. And the less moths you have, obviously, the less birds and bats and the, the whole ecosystem. And this little moth in the left hand corner is the pepper moth. And this is a wonderful little link to heritage in the fact that in the past it was peppered to uh, camouflage on trees with lichen. And in the, in the Industrial Revolution, it morphed uh, into a black version to, to camouflage against soot and pollution. And now it's reverting back to the peppered and you get them both together. And actually this picture was taken over Kimbridge um, because that's where we saw the two together. Some of the links with the plants are, these are the qualities that I'll get the, the group, the volunteers to choose what they'd like. And these are the criteria, ideally edible, medicinal, a link to the history, definitely good for pollinators and biodiversity gain, sensory. So people, you know, with not just visually, but smell, touch. Um, we really don't want to discriminate against anybody. So we want to, well, we want to bring in as many people as we can and, and to um, enlighten as many senses as we can, because obviously that's very good for well-being as well. And as you can see, that's what we put the table against. And obviously certain plants like fever few, which you normally wouldn't plant in a city centre, um, qualifies for lots of those. Um, and obviously the name fever few hints to its properties uh, of what it's used for. And I know that it has, it has been used by some people to treat migraines and headaches and roses as well, obviously very, very um, good for people and wildlife. Some of the things that the research, uh, the volunteers found quite interesting um, was how good boring old sages, um, and we, we used to, um, we don't include sages a lot in our diets anymore, but we should because it's, it has all these hidden benefits. Um, including some that we're researching as we speak, such as the bald, this one. And salvias and sages are wonderful for pollinators. Bees love them. And this picture was taken in uh, November and it just shows you how the urban heat effect carries on, um, protects from frosts, and there's a much longer flowering period in places like the middle of Birmingham. Um, we're also not restricted to plants just from the UK. This is Echinacea from North America, but anyone that grows Echinacea knows it's great for bees and butterflies and it's medicinal and you can take Echinacea. Um, it's said to be um, you know, good for immunity and, and fighting off colds and things like that. Also working with the water to improve the water quality. Um, plants are fantastic at absorbing even things like oil, holding them and breaking them down and, and making them safe. So we definitely wanted to put more um, natural habitats into the center of Birmingham. Also um, for little places, little pockets for a species to uh, be able to get through the city center. And this is the result, a wonderful, um, waterway fringe and full of damselflies now, which didn't used to breed in the city centre. And also that wonderful invertebrates and damselflies and improved water quality is fantastic for fish. Isn't that beautiful, like an aquarium? This is actually Wolverhampton top lock but obviously another very industrial legacy and past. Um, just showing you how good the ecosystem is nowadays. We also unfortunately have some exotics in the uh, canal network. This is the Wells catfish, um, huge appetite. And um, 
big impact on, on the um, environment. Uh, there was a documentary in France that showed that when, once they'd eaten all the fish in the river, um, they then turned on the pigeons that came down to bathe um, and pretended to be logs and floated up next to them. So obviously a big concern that these are in the uh, canal network. This was a fish rescue that we did and these turned up. And that was the other one that was found and that, that's still got some growing to do as well. And my friend Dave Martin sent me these in as well. Wonderful pictures of Lodge Farm Reservoir on, next to the Dudley Canal. Wonderful pictures. And all those fish, an improved ecosystem. has meant that the otter is now back through our area um, after a huge decline, catastrophic decline with DDT and persecution, uh, but now has reached all most of its um, former strongholds and um, is actually back on the canal network. This picture was taken um, on the Staffordshire and Worcestershire Canal, again, not too far away from where we are down at Kimber. And we've been running um, surveys now for three years with volunteers. Every year they go out and um, survey a section of canal and looking for the, the signs of otter. And if they find any signs, they send us a sample of the otter sprain, just a small piece. Um, and then we test it for DNA to see whether it's definitely an otter and see if it's a male or a female. And sometimes we can even try and see if it's an individual. And from that, We've got this result. Now, we haven't done the whole of the Midlands because it's such a huge area um, and we, we can get a lot of volunteers where there's a lot of people. So I've, I've sometimes the rural areas uh, miss out on this survey a little bit. But it's purposefully that we do want to see how the urban areas are doing. These are indicators of how well the, the canal's ecosystem is. As you can see, there's the, the um, green is the female otter, the orange is the male. And the, the black is the, either wasn't, we couldn't determine the DNA or it came back as a survey after we'd sent the DNA, DNA off. Um, and so as you can see, they have made it into the centre of Birmingham. The Staffordshire and Worcester is a stronghold and, and it has been for several decades now. Then on the um, Stratford Canals and the Grand Unions and the um, Town Valley and the, no, sorry, the um, Birmingham and Faisley Canal, um, still avoid in this Birmingham and Black Country area. And that's possibly maybe to do with lots of research and university um, students looking at this, um, possibly down to the fact that there's a lot of peripheral habitats in these areas. Whereas when we get into the urban Black Country, the canal is literally the only um, linear feature and there's not these brooks and rivers and ponds that they need to diversify the diets maybe or maybe it's to do with pollution with the one-off pollutants. So as every so often these urban areas might have a pollution incident, still lots of lots to be done. And obviously this is now targeting work of these um, wonderful canals up here and how we, how we can maybe get the otters through here. We're also looking at microplastic um, and whether that's in their diet. We know that microplastic is, uh, these are samples taken in Birmingham and these pictures are of um, microplastic and we, we fully expect that it's in their diet as well and how that and we don't know how that will affect them. Wonderful engagement with volunteers, couldn't get any of it done without this wonderful volunteers. Mixing lots of um, natives with um, introduced and non-native and variant variable very very variety plants sorry. Um, and as long as the bees and people like it, then it all fits in. Here, we sort of went with a cornfields theme. So the corn poppies and the apricots. Um, and this has worked very well because it's very low maintenance. And again, here the, is the peach orchard. And we're actually training these pear trees to form living barriers. Um, and this cornfield and corn marigolds and chamomile they never stopped flaring and they were actually flaring through the winter. Um, and it's just, it defies what we normally know about cornfields. Um, very, very wonderful and very um, proud of the volunteers work here. Like I say, a big audience are seeing what we're doing. So we can, without even 
them having to travel to an age reserve. They're working or commuting or on the lunch breaks, they can see what's going on and we can try and connect with them that way. And the more exotic, the better. We want to stop people. We want people to ask questions and even passion flowers, which are again medicinal from South America. The bees are happy, so I'm happy. And we're planting the plants that are deliberately attacked by insects because we want to increase the biomass of insects. So, you know, things like mullein, which gets the mullein moth um, and lots of other species of plants, even kale and cabbages, because we have to grow the organic seeded ones because often now uh, the seed is impregnated with pesticides from as soon as it germinates. So you won't get the, um, the pest caterpillars on it. And we really do want those pest caterpillars because we want to rebuild the the biodiversity, especially um, important for species like black red start, which are in decline in the area, and nasturtiums, which are edible for people, and white butterflies as well. So we've got to talk about it. So we're using these signs just to um, inform people. Um, get people asking questions, people are always asking what plants are growing, getting ideas, and we're trying to give them information. Um, and that has actually led on to um, the group creating the great canal orchard. So we're gonna create the longest canal orchard, well, the longest orchard in the country. Um, it all starts off by the fact that we've already got some wonderful trees and some wonderful old heritage trees along the canal. The canals do have a connection with um, fruit trees, particularly um, damsons and peri pears and uh, things that would have been associated with lock cottages. So people would have made preserves to get them through the winter and jams. Also, we want them to repl replicate, um, represent the community they pass through so that each community will decide what trees they want to grow. And also, um, as long as there's a core group of um, traditional orchard trees, we're also putting exotics in there and even things like um, pomegranates and grapes and things like that are not, not off the list at all. And we do want that link, uh, green gauges and damsons and medlars, a very old variety um, that's quite rare now. And this pear tree at Galton Valley might actually be um, a unique, very rare tree. Some of the peri pears in the Midlands are actually some of the rarest trees in the world. And we don't, this one is actually a quite a nice eater, but it's very small and very hard. Um, and it's very tasty. And it, we call it the Galton pear at the moment. And so we're propagating it and we wanna get it tested with DNA to see whether or not it's a variety or whether it's a unique um, special pear that's been lost to history. And the Tetanal Dick one is a, Tetanal Dick pear is a tree from the, the area as well. And that is a very rare tree that we've been propagating as well to put along into the canal orchards. And the orchards are obviously connected to people and wonderful for people, a, a natural resource of food, which uh, fiber and um, fruit, which we need more of, um, but also brilliant for wildlife. And fruit trees have an incredible biomass of insects and invertebrates, and they're obviously connected to um, species of bat which love orchards as well and the insects that are generated that is a, an eyed hawk moth which will turn into a lovely juicy protein package for a bat and also birds need the insects to feed the young and they'll also need the fruit in to get them through the winter and right now um, look out for honeysuckle and dog rose again dog rose is a little bit um, underplayed it's a wonderful plant for wildlife and in the in the past, we would have collected the rose hips to make rose hip syrup, and people were actually paid uh, during the war to collect rose hips to because of the high vitamin C content and the helping get us boost our immunity through colds and flu. At the moment, we're just getting the um, scarlet tiger moths coming through, and actually, they do breed along the canals. And when I was a child, this this moth was restricted to the southwest, and it's actually colonised along the waterways. Um, and that caterpillar there was down just outside Kidderminster. And I've since found them on Comfrey uh, near Kimber. Uh, so this Comfrey, an introduced plant in itself, um, escaped from gardens, wonderful for bees and actually 
now proving very valuable to get this beautiful day flying moth um, along the network. Have a look for glowworms. We do get them on a canal network. They're very rare. Um, we know there's glowworms in the South Staffordshire, but we don't know if they're on the canal. So if you're walking, uh, do keep an eye out for a lovely little faint glow. Canals are very important for toad populations. Huge declines in toads, but they, they're actually doing okay on certain sections of canal. Um, look at the moment for dark black tadpoles swarming like this. Um, they're distasteful for, to fish, so they, they swim around free from persecution and they actually like the canals because of the fish. And they're just getting the back legs and starting to turn into little toadlets. Getting a few reports of grass snakes around the area as well. So um, please treat them with respect and, and give them a bit of space. They're harmless and uh, wonderful parts of our natural heritage. <clears throat> <coughs> We're um, this is high rattle. So I mentioned earlier about our, our towpath management and how sometimes we don't get it right and sometimes we do. And so this autumn, this summer, sorry, we're going to be using a lot of hay rattle seed because this is parasitic on grass, so it reduces the grass growth. And we're hoping that certain sections of towpath, we can use this as a grassland management. So we're going to be doing that um, the next few months. Keep an eye out for this invasive, Azolla, um, highly invasive, one of the fastest growing plants in the world. Um, we're having quite a bad problem on certain parts of the canal network, particularly around Warsaw and um, Sandwell at the moment. Possibly due to the very mild winter we've had, mild, cold winters get this plant back in check. It's in the winter it's red and in the summer it's green, floats on the surface of the water. Um, and what we've been doing recently is uh, releasing weevils. So these little fellas here, I don't know if you can spot the weevils, there's a picture of the larva and there's a picture of two weevils mating. Sorry, it's before the watershed. Have you spotted them yet? And there's the weevils mating. And there's the larva. So these are incredible at controlling azolla. They only eat azolla, and all the brown fronds up here are the larva which have got into the root system and start eat, attacking the plant from the inside. And they can control an outbreak of azolla within a couple of months. Really wonderful biological control. Also, um, just as a hazard, look out for giant hogweed. Um, occurs along rivers. Um, not so much along canals and where we see it, we treat it and control it. One of the problems with giant hogweed is it's sap. So in warm weather, if you brush against it and you get a certain reaction with sunlight, it can cause severe blisters. So if you do see this plant, please report it um, and, we'll, and we'll treat it straight away, especially if it's near a towpath like this. Originally from Eastern Europe, um, remember it was once an ornamental plant. So it's just under certain situations that it can actually cause problems, but we, we can't take that risk. We have to treat this plant straight away. And don't confuse it with common hogweed, which can get to six feet as well. Common hogweed is a very good wildlife plant and doesn't have the same harmful properties. Another project that we'll be working on is the uh, Lesser Horseshoe project. So we're trying to um, find funding to help this little bat through the landscape. So this is one of the most northern areas of this species. Um, just like the otter was restricted to the southwest. And again, just like the otter, we believe is using the canal network and waterways to um, reclaim some of its lost territories. And um, it's a, it doesn't like disturbance. So it's trying to find places to tuck away and get and hide away and save Staffordshire has got quite an important population um, to get them through to the north. And little projects like um, Devil's Den, where we put a canal door on it, has actually helped them little satellite roosts, getting them through the landscape. And the next step is to turn maybe some of our old buildings, such as pump houses, into actual, restore them for the heritage and actually give them space um, to roost as well. Thank you very much. Sorry, I've gone over a little bit. Um, 
I'll finish the talk there now. And if we like to ask any questions, sorry, I've gone over, but that's not too bad for me. I normally go a couple of hours over, so it's not too bad. Hey, Paul, that was excellent. Thank you so much. You're wonderful as, as, as always. Fascinating. So much information there. And, and, and you could have gone on. That was, that was brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, now we're about, uh, I think YouTube runs about sort of 30, 40 seconds behind. So, uh, anybody got any questions, please do ask them for Paul. Um, I've got one for you, Paul. Um, Sage, baldness, where can I get a job lost? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, 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 sage seems like a real super plant and something that seems, it went out of fashion a little bit. So sage and onion stuffing used to be quite common. Yeah. But, um, you know, just you can get you can grow sage in all its varieties. The the supermarkets are actually a very cheap way of growing of getting potted sage. Yeah, and just 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 put it in your diet. You know, just every every evening, gra grab a few leaves, and if it doesn't cure baldness, it might cure something else. Exactly, it's got to be worth a try, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's always worth a try. Absolutely, yeah, full, of, full of good minerals. So one of the things that um we learned with the wild in Birmingham is that. We just don't include a lot of diversity in our diets anymore. Mm. So in the past, we'd have had seasonal and we'd have grown things and you'd have literally only had the choice of certain plants through the year. So you'd have actually changed your diet through the year and all these things are building up and helping us. Whereas now we've, um, you know, we can have, we can have the same diet and we can go to the supermarket and get the same shopping all the way through the year. And we, yeah. we don't have that diversity anymore. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's something we've lost, isn't it? yeah absolutely uh linda said she saw weight loss uh on the sage thing so yeah she's happy as well um i've got a question here um now i don't know who dell is somebody's shown up on zoom as dell so type your naming because i'm not sure who you are but um uh, asking could the otter control signal crayfish and the introduced catfish yes definitely otters love um crayfish and where the crayfish occur, they occur in high densities. So the, the otter will um, obviously exploit that food resource. The, the, the one thing about otters is that they have huge territories. And so it's a good thing and a bad thing. So they won't eliminate um, the crayfish because what they do is they take a bit and then move on. And we know this when we were video trapping that otter. So that, that was actually in a lot cottage garden and um, the person was actually kept restocking it with fish. And no matter how many fish were in there, the otter would never take all the fish and it would, wouldn't return for about 13, 14, 15 days a time. So it was obviously traveling. And, and one of the reasons it does that is to make sure it has a very high resource um, to, uh, as it's, to attract a mate. So as if it's got lots of wildlife, um, lots of fish, lots of crayfish, lots of amphibians, then it's likely to attract a female into that territory and mate. Whereas if it's depleted everything, then a female won't even enter that territory. So it, it will help control, but it won't eliminate. Um, and some of the catfish will probably give it a good fight for its money, to be honest. <laughs> really? Well, yeah. No, otters are very, very capable predators. Um, yeah. Mind you, those catfish were huge. Yes, and they can grow. I think over time they could probably reach five, six feet as well. Um, so they're formidable predators. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now, Ian's got a question. So I'm just going to, uh, Ian's unmuted and uh, yeah, fire away, Ian. Ian's got a question for Paul. Right. I've got quite a few friends who have wildlife areas in their gardens and one of the plants that they find very valuable as a food plant for the invertebrates is actually alkanet and i just wondered if that's one of the plants that you use paul uh, we haven't yet but i i agree with you it is a wonderful, <coughs> wonderful plant especially um for bees early on in the year it's actually spread quite a lot um it's an introduced plant from cottage gardens i believe it's european it's actually quite common along the canals now um, and it's spread and it's quite welcome as well. It's one of those in, introduced plants that actually provides a benefit. But um, 
We'll, we'll certainly look into the, the properties of that because obviously Alconet's interesting in, in the very name. Um, you know, what, what's, you know, what medicinal properties would it have? Um, yeah, we've, there's so many plants. I think there's, I think there's about um, 200,000 plants in medical research at the moment or more. Um, so it's just, yeah, we'll, we'll look into that. Uh, one, one, funny enough, um, I've, I've um, obviously in the lockdown, I've been growing as much as I can and I've been growing kale and cabbages and some of the best plants for bees and pollinators are actually um, cabbages and kale when they flower. Wow. So you're not only getting the edible food, but actually there are really good plants for pollinators, which you don't think of vegetables. Um, you think flowers or vegetables, one or the other. But um, yeah, especially the purple kale, because it looks stunning. And when it flowers with the yellow flowers, it's, it's as ornamental as any flower. Wow. Interesting. Yeah, I didn't realise that, Paul. Um, Alan says that, uh, Alan and Sue say that Alconet also supports the tiger moth, moth colonies, uh, even more than comfrey. OK, that's brilliant. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for that. That's a useful one. Yeah. Um, uh, Linda's asking, have otters been seen in this area? Yes, they, they're, they've been on the Staffordshire and Worcestershire for 20 years now. Mm. Um, the numbers, what we're finding is the numbers, um, the territories fluctuate and we don't know whether that's due to them um, being killed by road casualties or persecution or whether it's moving with food resources. So in the fourth year, we're finding that the, the territories are slightly different, you know, maybe a kilometre apart. Uh, they're not always fixed. Um, and they, they do they do get run over. You know, we have even more more casualties found on roads, which sometimes um, is seen as a as a positive thing in the fact that the numbers are quite high and they're exploring new areas, so they're they're getting more um, casualties because they're they're having being pushed out of areas where there's already otters. Yeah. Uh, so as terrible as it is to find one, it's actually a, a like the polecats. You can only record polecats really by road casualties and. And that's seen, that's seen the increase of them um, across the Midlands and the canal network as well. We, we, know, we, we think we've seen evidence that they use the canal network as well as a corridor. Yeah. So bad news for the individual otter, but good news overall that there's enough of them to get run over, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's, it's, possibly, it's possibly a sign that it's, um, otters are very territorial. They will, and, and one of the biggest controls on otter populations are otters themselves. Mm. So... There's a lot of violence. Most otters um, taken into rescue centres have got really bad wounds from other otters. Wow. And so it might be that they're just, you know, they're this year's youngsters, last year's youngsters trying to find new territories. Yeah. And obviously the roads are so busy nowadays. Yeah. Am, am I right that uh, I've got somewhere in my head that in Wombun, otters were seen down at this, the sewerage works down at Smesto? and close to the canal there as well at some point was that that might have been a couple of three years ago now but i think wouldn't be surprised yeah i'm right I've only, I've only seen um four otters in the midlands and one of them was down um at stew pony yeah now, i was doing a bat survey and there was an otter on the towpath um there and there was also a noise that i i believe there was a no there was a female otter in the area as well um from the note the alarm that was called yeah so, so there are perhaps around yeah. Along with Staffs and Worcester, yeah. Oh, they're, they're around, they're around, yeah. Uh, okay, uh, got some more questions for you here. Uh, Tim says that the, the Bradley arm is often a blue hue, especially in the summer. What is this and how does it affect diversity? And then says, how would the potential reopening of the connection between the Warsaw Stroke main canal change things? So that wonderful blue hue that you often see on the train as you go past um, <clears throat> is from the Braidley, the top of Braidley has got pumps. So as well as reservoirs, we have pumps. And because it's coming from groundwater, it's full of minerals. So it's a certain type of mineral that colours it that blue colour. Yeah. And the Braidley arm is actually absolutely um, rich in pond plants and fish and invertebrates and, and particularly high population of smooth newts. So it's obviously not a harmful um, chemical. So it's, it's literally the base minerals from the, the ground pumping. And the connection will um, probably be a very good thing. 
because um, it will connect the Warsaw Canal as, as a corridor through a series of locks and it will, it will increase the amount of habitat as well. So real opportunity to um, get something positive there. Yeah. Yeah. Good, good, good um, um, Julian Cartwright uh, says, good evening. We frequently come across uh, otter uh, spraying on our walks along the Staps and Water Canal in the Smasto Valley. Should we be reporting this to anyone? Yes, um, well, we, we do our surveys in, in February uh, because it's a great time to find otter sprains. It's also a time when there's not a lot of other wildlife surveys going on. Also, people maybe have um, overindulged over Christmas and might want to go walk in a bit of canal. So it's a great opportunity. Um, but what we, what we wanted to, this year, we wanted to um, scale up that and do a summer survey as well, because we wanted to see how much the, the territories moved in the summer. So for instance, when I survey the Staffs and Worcester, I've noticed that areas that are very prominent in the winter with sprains, sometimes those sprains will disappear altogether in the summer. So we want to see where they're going to. So the more information, the better, especially if they're walking in the same section, maybe to make a note every month of, of the sprain. And often you can tell whether it, how long it's been there. Uh, we, we should, I, I hope people have eaten. We won't go into too much detail about the, uh, the sprain qualities, but you can tell if it's, if it's recent or if it's several weeks old. Mm. There's a lot of information that can be gained from that, especially if you're walking re regularly, you can then pick up how fresh the sprains are. Excellent. Not not literally pick up. Obviously. Yeah. Okay. How big are they? I'm just I'm interested now, Paul. How big is otter poo? It varies, um, and it varies on how how mature and successful the otter is. So mm. a, a successful otter will have a large territory, and you might not even notice the sprain. It will just be a scent mark. Mm. Um, whereas an immature might do a sort of cigar, <laughs> cigar shaped. Yeah. Yeah, so it, it varies. And sometimes you get a huge pile. Um, I've seen on the Staffordshire and Worcestershire, it was piled and piled and piled up on one of the coping stones. Really? Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. And uh, Julian says as, as well, uh, and says, and terrapins as well. Um, that was Julian who was referring, uh, no, it wasn't, it was Tim, sorry, Tim, who says, and terrapins, who was referring to the uh, Brady arm. And I guess the clear water that you were talking about, you know, with the with the minerals in there, that yeah. there are terrapins in there as well. Yeah, um, we've had quite a few reports of terrapins around as well um, on the Stairbridge Canal, Staffs and Worcestershire Canal. Uh, these are they're, they're long lived animals. They're obviously people buy them as little pets and don't realise that they can live up to 30, 40 years. Mm. Um, release them into the wild thinking they're doing the right thing or they might have escaped as well. Um, generally, they're individuals, so we're not concerned about them because uh, I actually rescued one several years ago from a lock restoration down on the Droitwich Canal, and uh, I rehomed it, and then that person um, had, had ill health and asked me to take it back, so I dug a pond for it, and I, I did a little bit of a study on it, and actually it didn't affect wildlife at all. The sparrows used to bath on top of it. Um, the frogs, it would actually help because he ate some of the tadpoles, but he could never catch most of them. And so the tadpoles actually turned out bigger and stronger than the wildlife pond tadpoles did. It didn't eat the newts because they were nocturnal. And so they're not, they're, they're not great hunters and they're, they're not going to do any more damage than may, maybe a similar size carp would. So we're not really concerned. The only concern would be if in the future it gets warmer and they can actually start breeding. Um, mm -hmm. But they're actually they're not the the red eared terrapin is now banned from sale, so the numbers shouldn't really get any 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 higher than they already are. So I guess it's a case of you just monitoring them. Yeah, um, just well, and also not, no, um, people enjoy it. You know, it's a it's a, it's unusual. It, we I've tried catching one years ago, and it's impossible. So <laughs> really, and they're not going to do any harm. So it's not. Please don't release them. But um, where they are, maybe just let them have the retirement in peace. <laughs> Sounds like a good plan, doesn't it? Yeah, it's what we all want. Um, anybody got any other questions for Paul? Please do put them in the chat window uh, on YouTube and I'll put them to Paul. Um, I've got one for you here, Paul. Um, just thinking that one of the pictures you showed, I'm not sure whether it was close to the Chance Brothers um, works, which of course are going to be, they're being redone, aren't they? 
uh, they've been done up and used as a, as a leisure facility. I wondered if there's any plans for you to do any work along that stretch of the canal by the Chance Brothers. Um, yeah. and Chance's Glassworks. Uh, yeah, yeah, Chance's Glassworks. Yeah, we, we've got a big project, which is obviously um, just coming back into after being on hold, mm. uh, called Revolution Walk. Mm. So that goes from Chance's Glass House all the way into the Roundhouse in central Birmingham. Right. So there's a whole load of um, funding allocated to that whole corridor for um, built and natural heritage. Excellent. Excellent. It is. That's a wonderful area. Yeah, because that's such a big project. And I think if that comes off as it's planned to, that's going to make such a change to uh, a, a real, well, a, a globally historically important area, isn't it? Yes. And, and also um, that canal was relatively unused considering the population that actually live right on top of it and um, so it's getting those communities to actually find out you know what's so wonderful and you know Galton Bridge you know it almost looks like Iron Bridge you know it's, yeah. it's uh, you don't have to travel to Shropshire to see some really important yeah to study areas and I was I've been reading the Black Countryman magazine you know there seems to be this awakening uh, of industrial archaeology um, and we're, we're suddenly taking a step back and appreciating what's around us even more, you know, in some of the what's been traditionally viewed as, as some of the the uglier landscapes, suddenly we're, we're taking a step back, seeing it and thinking, actually, it's not that ugly after all in, in its own way. A lot of this stuff is just beautiful. Yeah. You know, brilliant. Listen, Paul, thank you so, so much for your time this evening. It's always a pleasure to have you along. And as I say, you know, you, you stood in at short notice for us uh, and gave us your, your talk, your insights and your and your knowledge into the uh, canal network of the of the Midlands and the natural history there. Um, I've learned a lot this evening. I'm sure that um, the, the members of the society and the visitors uh, who've been watching us on uh, YouTube have learned lots too. So listen, thank you so much for your time. Will you come back and talk to us again at some point? Of course. Wonderful. Yeah. Thanks so much, Paul. Please thank con you very much. continue your work. Um, stay healthy and uh, hopefully you can get back up to full speed with the volunteers and with the work that you do uh, very, very soon when the, the world returns to something like normal. So thank you so much for that this evening. Um, and thank you everybody for watching as well. Um, I hope that you've uh, enjoyed yourself over the last hour and 10 minutes or so. Um, as I say, always great to have uh, Paul talk to us. We always learn so much uh, from Paul and it'll be great to see him at some point in the flesh again won't it at one of our meetings uh, we look forward to that um, so um, our next meeting I think is Thursday the 16th of July if I'm correct I'm just going to have to uh, check my diary and Paul it'd be lovely to see you virtually on that one uh, if you want to join in and listen this time instead of doing work um, yeah pleasure uh, so that's the 16th of July um, I'm just in the process of confirming the speaker for the 16th of July but put that in your diaries and what I'll do is uh, send an email out to members and let you know uh, the time and the Zoom uh, address for that so you can join us by Zoom if you'd like to uh, and I'll also put on there the YouTube address as well if you are watching on YouTube and you haven't subscribed yet could you click the subscribe button for us uh, it's actually quite important because if if we can get over a certain number of subscribers that means that we get a much more friendly YouTube address uh, than the series of numbers and letters that you see at the moment so please do click on subscribe on there so uh, I think that's just about it um, Thank you again to Paul. Thank you all for watching this evening. Uh, and whatever you're doing, stay safe, stay healthy, and we will see you very, very soon. Thanks again and good night all. Stay safe. <laughs>